Good afternoon. I am Zachary Myers, United States Attorney for the Southern District of Indiana. Combating economic crimes is a top priority for our office. And working with federal, state, and local law enforcement, we're committed to investigating and prosecuting complex and large-scale frauds and holding fraudsters accountable. As part of these efforts, we're here today to announce federal charges against four individuals for allegedly defrauding the public of over $44 million by fraudulently inflating student enrollment at two related online charter schools, Indiana Virtual School and Indiana Virtual Pathways Academy. I'm joined today by Special Agent in Charge Herbert Stapleton of the FBI's Indianapolis Field Office, Special Agent in Charge John Woolley of the United States Department of Education's Office of Inspector General, Captain Ron Galviz of the Indiana State Police, Indiana Inspector General David Cook, whose agencies are investigating this case. We're also joined by the State Examiner Paul Joyce of the Indiana State Board of Accounts, the agency that audited the schools and referred their findings to law enforcement for criminal investigation. The indictment returned by the grand jury charges three men with multiple federal crimes. Tom Stoughton Sr., who owned and controlled uh, Indiana Virtual Schools, Indiana Virtual Pathways Academy, and multiple related companies. He's charged with one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud, 16 counts of wire fraud, and 57 counts of money laundering. Philip Holden, the director of IBS, is charged with one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud and 16 counts of wire fraud. And Percy Clark, the superintendent of IBS and IBPA, is charged with one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud, 16 counts of wire fraud, and 11 counts of money laundering. In addition, unsealed today is the plea agreement and information charging Christopher King, former manager of school operations for Alphacom, a for-profit company allegedly controlled by Stoughton, who has, in, who has entered a plea of guilty to conspiracy to commit wire fraud. The indictment alleges that the defendants and others conspired to defraud the state of Indiana of over $44 million through their operation of Indiana Virtual School and Indiana Virtual Pathways Academy. Like traditional schools, like traditional public schools, as well as brick and mortar charter schools, Indiana funds virtual charter schools based upon the number of students that the school claimed to be enrolled and attending. In general, the more students enrolled at a school, the more money the school receives from the state of Indiana. Funding levels are generally based on the number of students enrolled at the school on a specific date referred to as a count day. Students are considered enrolled if they're registered and attending or receiving services at that school or from that school on count day. And virtual charter schools like IVS and IVPA were required to monitor student activity and withdraw students who were not attending or participating in services. These virtual schools were required to withdraw students who didn't in for an extended period of time. Nevertheless, the members of the falsely claimed thousands of students were enrolled, even though those students were not attending classes or receiving services. They did this through several fraudulent practices alleged in the indictment, including prohibited employee, prohibiting employees unenrolling purported students who had not logged in or participated in class for months, directing that employees stop obtaining verification that a student in fact wanted to attend the virtual schools before they were enrolled or re-enrolled, directing the use of information from incomplete student applications to enroll those students, most of whom never participated in any way directing employees to identify approximately 600 students who were previously unenrolled and weren't attending but weren't attending another school according to state records. These approximately 600 students were re-enrolled without their authorization shortly before count day in September of 2018. The Indiana Virtual School received an F grade from the Indiana Department of Education putting it at risk for losing its charter and losing its funding. And in 2017, Stoughton and members of, the of, uh, members of the conspiracy are alleged to have created a new charter school, Indiana Virtual Pathways Academy, and induced Daleville Community Schools to authorize it as well. 
After IVPA was created, the conspirators transferred hundreds of students who hadn't been attending any classes from IVS onto the enrollment books of IVPA to continue to count and receive money for those students, but protect IVS from being held accountable for their non-attending students' non-performance by IDOE. In January of 2018, hundreds of students were found to be in violation of Indiana Virtual School's engagement policy due to their inactivity. Rather than withdraw them, however, Stoughton is alleged to have directed that hundreds of those students simply be transferred from IVS to IVPA so that the defendants could continue to count them and receive payment for their enrollment. As a result of these fraudulently inflated enrollment numbers, the state of Indiana paid IVS and IVPA in excess of $44 million, more than they would have received had they claimed their enrollments accurately. To reduce the cost of operating the schools, in or before May of 2016, Stoughton allegedly directed that members of the school's information technology staff track the actual logons and participation of their students and directed that IVS teachers would be paid based upon the number of students who actually logged on and attended classes, as opposed to the number of students that Stoughton and his co-conspirators claimed to IDOE were enrolled in the schools for the purpose of obtaining state funding. At multiple points from 2015 through 2018, employees questioned why students were still being counted as enrolled, even when they were not participating or attending the schools. Stoughton and his co-conspirators allegedly directed that no student be unenrolled, and when employees went so far as to do so, as, as so far as to unenroll some non-participating students, Stoughton and his co-conspirators allegedly ordered that those students be re-enrolled so that they would still be counted on count day. Beginning in 2017, Stoughton allegedly paid another individual to sign documents on behalf of shell companies created in that person's name. Stoughton then caused the transfer of millions of dollars from IVS and IVPA to for-profit companies he allegedly controlled. And from there, the money was transferred between multiple such companies until ultimately ending up in bank accounts controlled by Stoughton, members of his family, Clark, and others. Each of the, indictment, each of the indicted defendants was arrested this week and made their initial appearance in federal court and was ordered released on conditions until trial, which will be scheduled at a later date. If convicted, each defendant faces between 10 and 20 years in federal prison for each count. The charges in the indictment are allegations, and each of those defendants remains innocent until proven guilty. Taxpayers rightfully expect that their hard-earned money is being used to educate our children as intended. Stealing public money from our educational system deprives Hoosier students of the services and opportunities that are vital to all of our futures. It is imperative that federal and state law enforcement continue to invest our resources in complex investigations and ensure that any individuals engaged in these sorts of frauds are held accountable. That can only happen with the efforts of talented and dedicated prosecutors and investigators like those who are handling the case. I'm proud of their efforts, including our assistant U.S. attorneys Bradley Shepard and Sam Spiro, who are prosecuting this case. Thank you all very much. And now, Herbert Stapleton, Special Agent in Charge for the FBI in Indianapolis. Thank you, U.S. Attorney Myers. Cases like these don't make themselves. And I'd like to spend just a few minutes talking about what led to the successful charges that uh, the U.S. Attorney has announced today from an investigative standpoint. First of all, frequently in a major fraud uh, in a major fraud investigation like this, the FBI or even its law enforcement partners may not be the first people to realize that something is off in a certain scenario. And this case is no exception. In this particular case, it was the State Board of Accounts of Indiana who put a significant amount of effort into identifying that there was a potential fraud here, and they did the right thing by referring it to law enforcement. That cooperation was critical to launching the investigation that led to these charges. I'd also talk to, like to talk a little bit about the partnerships that we enjoy here in the state of Indiana, which without those law enforcement partnerships, we would not be able to bring cases like this. The people standing behind me on the podium from the Indiana State Police, 
from the state uh, uh, state sorry uh, state inspector general's office uh, from the Department of Education inspector general's office uh, were critical in moving this case forward and in dealing with the complexities and volume of evidence that we uh, were required to go through to prove our case in this particular instance. This case was extremely complex, as you heard the U.S. Attorney say. The volume of documents uh, was enormous. It's really difficult to, uh, to overstate um, how challenging these cases can be. Hundreds of thousands of records, uh, relevant to, potentially relevant to the case, have to be uh, reviewed and analyzed and categorized. Several hundred bank accounts um, require forensic attention to determine whether or not any of the payments uh, being made were uh, payments in furtherance of a fraud. And hundreds of interviews had to be conducted, uh, many of which included interviews of fraudulently enrolled students or their parents including in one particular instance, an interview of a student's parents who was enrolled after that student had already passed away. This was an extraordinarily difficult and long road for our team, and I'm very proud of the work that they did. Based on the cooperation, the partnerships, and the solid uh, investigative work, persistent uh, pursuit of justice in this particular case has led to these uh, charges being announced today. Thank you. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Mr. U.S. Attorney, where did the money go and what did they spend it on? So as alleged in the indictment, there are a number of counts of money laundering related to the use of proceeds of the frauds um, that are on, I believe, the last page of the indictment or before um, the forfeiture allegations, which is just representative of some of the uses, um, allegedly, of the proceeds of the fraud. Such as? Um, such as purchases of vehicles, boats, um, coins, as well as payment of uh, private school tuition. Now, that's just you know a, a portion of the amount of money that's alleged in the indictment, but in terms of what's currently on the public record. How many total students uh, were fraudulently claimed to be enrolled, and what percentage of their actual enrollment did that represent? So, as to the first question, I believe the number uh, as listed in the indictment is in excess of 4,500. And in terms of your second question, that's not currently in the public record. Is the $44 million, or do you believe that's the total amount that uh, was involved in the fraud? I think the state lawsuit is alleged to be more than that, or is that uh, just what you've been able to document? So, so the, the state and federal you know, lawsuits, of course, are, are separate things, and we are, we are working under different laws, different periods of time that we're able to include in what we're bringing forward. So I think there's a number of reasons why those cases, you know, if, you, if you look at the documents and those, why they may be different. But we are limited to the scope of the charges that we brought at this time, and I believe that the Attorney General's lawsuit um, is more expansive in terms of the time period they're able to cover. What is the responsibility of the Daleville Community Schools should they have known that this was going on? How much money did Daleville Community Schools realize from this? So in terms of the amount of money, that's not um, listed in, in, at least in the public documents in our case. And in terms of your, your other question, I'm not going to sort of opine at this stage in the investigation and, and prosecution as to what people should or shouldn't have done. Did Daleville Community Schools cooperate with the investigation? I'm not going to uh, comment on, on that. I've got to limit my comments to what's on the public record. There's Do they the face any charges? The only individuals who are currently charged are the four individuals we're discussing today. There's an individual that's unnamed in the indictment. Can you uh, explain why they're unnamed? I don't think they're ones that are facing charges, but you still list them as a defendant? I don't have any comments on that at this time. How can taxpayers get the money back? So one of the things that's included in the indictment is what we call a forfeiture allegation, where under federal law, when individuals engage in crimes that um, you know, involve the receipt of, of money fraudulently, then should they be convicted, we can also um, seek to have money that either is the money that was taken or substitute assets that represent sort of the same amounts. And we're able to use, after a conviction and after sort of a forfeiture order, we're able to use you know, the same sorts of collection tools we would use elsewhere in the federal government and attempt to recoup as much of that money as possible to apply towards restitution or other legal avenues we have to get money from people who are convicted of crimes that has proceeds of those crimes into the hands of victims. Do you think that there's anything the state could have done to prevent this fraud <coughs> for allegedly having a 
for so long or for such a, a long period, or was it just the complexity of how the, the schools were, were carrying out? I'm, I'm not really in a position to comment on that right now. How did the scheme impact the quality of education to children who were legitimately trying to get an education through these uh, entities? Sorry, I appreciate that. That's not a question I can answer either. Chris King, I see he entered guilt, a plea of guilty, but he's not formally charged with anything, but still has the benefit. How does that work out? So Mr. King is charged in a separate charging document called an information. Um, so as opposed to the charges returned by the grand jury, Mr. King was charged in the separate document within the same case and pled guilty to that information pursuant to a plea agreement. And so he, his case will not be proceeding to trial, but as part of the same case. Has he been cooperating with the investigation? Is that why he's been a from that? I'm not going to comment on that. What's the jail time for each of these charges, or what's the range of jail time? So each of those counts carries, depending on which count it was, but in general, a uh, maximum of 10 or 20 years in federal prison per county. Is this the largest fraud case that you're prosecuting in relation to education fraud? Um, I can't, in terms of, you know, the, the two and a half years when, since I've been a U.S. attorney, you know, yes, but, you know, I can't really comment on the years and years of if there are other cases involving um, fraud on the Department of Education or frauds related to education funding. I'm not a position to answer, but I'm happy to take a look afterwards and see. Are you expecting to go to trial in these cases, or is there a plea agreement and negotiations going on? What's well, that um, it's generally not something we comment on, but I'll say that whenever someone is indicted by a federal grand jury, they have a right to go to trial, or they might decide to enter a plea of guilty, and that's just part of the criminal process. Thank you. Thank you all very much.